final uh, speaker in this particular session is uh, Professor Charles Burnett. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and it's a great honour to be able to talk to you this morning and to continue to talk about the Islamic heritage. Uh, my work has been entirely on the Islamic heritage in the Western tradition, having heard about the Ottoman heritage, um, having heard um, about the... Uh, let me get, um, yeah. <laughs> having, uh, having heard about the transmission, um, uh, uh, some of the transmission from Arabic into the West uh, through Adelaide of Bath, Jared and Cremona and so on, um, I am now going to concentrate on one phrase um, which you come across uh, um, um, in the West, and that is Arabic veritas, the Arabic truth. Um, now, we all know a lot about truth and half-truth and... Um, um, uh, uh, fake news and all that sort of thing, but um, in this context, um, truth is really very important. Um, now, this th this phrase Arabic truth occurs, um, for example, in the work of Stephen of Antioch, who translated an enormous Amer medical compendium by Ib uh, Al Ibn al-Abbas al-Majusi in the early um, 12th century. Um, this compendium consisted of ten books of practice, ten books of um, theory, and he criticised an earlier translation um, because in this earlier translation one chapter didn't correspond to the Arabic. Um, and he said um, about this chapter, um, um, we have found in the Latin, the Latin version of the previous translator, what the Arabic veritas, the Arabic truth, does not have. We will, uh, if you go back to the Arabic, you will find that it's simply not there. We are the translators only of what is in the Arabica Veritas. Moreover, Stephen defends himself against attacks of his contemporaries by saying that if they suspect that he said anything incorrectly, they should consult the truth of the Arabs, the Arabicum Veritas. The first meaning of these phrases in both cases is the original Arabic, of course. This is also the sense used by his 12th century colleagues in the phrase, using the phrase Hebraica Veritas, the Hebrew truth. Um, this refers to the original language of the Old Testament and is used when contrasting the Septuagint, which was translated from Greek. Um, and, but in Veritas, there's also the implication of a literal translation, preserving the truth. In the early 6th century, um, common era, Boethius defended his literal method, the verbum de verba method, as we and he called it, of translating the works of Aristotle into Latin. These were the foundational works in logic used in the Middle Ages. And he defended this method by saying the reason for this initiative is that in those writings in which the knowledge of things is required, not the delight of a um, delightful ora oration, but incorrupt truth, incorrupt veritas, um, should be expressed. And to do this, one should render each Greek word with a Latin word which has been squeezed out of and closely compared with the original Greek word. Stephen of Antioch had accused the previous translator of Ali ibn al-Abbas um, of deceit, of fraus, um, by putting forward his own name as the author of the work he was translating. He was not being truthful. So the translator had to be truthful and had to produce a literal, a very literal translation of the original text and not put any of his own personality, any of his own thoughts into this um, uh, translation. It was a moral obligation. Arabic texts included important information about things. Boethius was referring to the importance of conveying things, and thus had to be translated literally. But this truth was often hidden, either because of the obscurity of the Arabic language or because it was so profound that it needed explanation, or it was deliberately hidden lest it fell into the hands of the wrong people. Herman of Carinthia, one of the translators of Arabic mathematical works, from geometry through to astronomy and astrology, in the second quarter of the 12th century, wrote an original work based on these translations and his extensive knowledge of Latin literature, which he simply called On the Essences, De Essences, 
written in Béziers in 1143. At the beginning of his work, he refers specifically to the Arabic learning that he and his translator, his fellow translator, Robert of Ketton, had been studying as something that was hidden under flashy clothing. It was made to look very special. Um, I quote from his address to Robert. He said, people were admiring the outer trappings and elegant decorations that long vigils and our most earnest labour had acquired for us from the depths of the treasury, treasuries of the Arabs. How much more they would value the undergarments if it were lawful for them to look at them. He goes on to say, I dared not reveal these undergarments. Um, because I feared to commit the crime of Numenius. We read this um, in the Latin text of Macrobius, the uh, late uh, fourth century writer, that Numenius was a philosopher too curious about hidden things. He dreamt that because he had revealed the secrets of the Eleusinian mysteries, he saw the goddesses of Eleusis dressed as prostitutes, standing in front of a brothel with its doors wide open. In fact, Hermann was reassured in a dream by Athena, goddess of wisdom herself, that it was allowable for him to reveal the details of arithmetic, geometry, music and astronomy that he had got from the Arabic treasuries. And thanks to that, we have the Arabic knowledge of these subjects, both in his original work on the essences and his, in his translations from Arabic into Latin. That true knowledge was hard, or was hidden, or hard to find, but could be searched for in Arabic writings, is almost a light motif among the 12th century translators. Hugo of Santalia, another translator of works on the science of the stars, tells us how his patron, Michael, Bishop of Tarazona, found an Arabic manuscript within the most secret depths of the library, in the Secretiora Bibliotheca Penetralia. Um, uh, in the library of the last Muslim kings of Saragossa. Uh, and he goes on to translate many texts from this library or from this manuscript on astronomy, astrology and mathematics. Herman of Corinthia adds a proof of the truth of Arabic learning a little later in his On the Essences. He rehearsed the common Christian objections to Islam, the denial of the divinity of Christ, uh, and the claim that a simulacrum of Christ was hung on the cross. But then he quotes one Arabic author, Abu Ma'asha, um, as demonstrating from natural proofs that Christ would be born from a virgin mother. He is referring to Abu Masha's description of the celestial images in the first decan of the sign of Virgo, in the first ten degrees of this zodiac sign, which consist of a young woman nourishing a boy with her breast milk and a man sitting beside her on her throne, um, but not touching her. Abu Masha, therefore, I quote, could not deny consciousness of the truth, even though he did not openly omit, um, admit uh, admit uh, Christianity. Even in natural speculation in celestial physics, the truth of Jesus Christ was in fact first known by a foreign nation. That is what Hermann says. He credits the astrologer as a natural science with seeing, as natural scientists with seeing the whole situation more clearly. And he then provides a rational explanation. The breast milk comes from flesh. No woman who has been able to feed um, a child um, has been able to feed a child on this unless she has given birth beforehand. So she must be a mother, but the man sitting beside her as a constellation is not touching her. Therefore, the philosopher, Herman adds, sees her as being completely chaste. And the argument goes on like this. Thus it seems the truth can come from the Arabs, but it is truth that relies or can be proved by reason, not revelation. The idea that the Arabs are rational and should be followed because um, of this is the leitmotif of Adelard of Bath's Natural Questions. We've already had um, some explanation of Adelard's contribution. Um, here, Adelard undertakes a seven-year journey in pursuit of Arabum Studia, the studies of the Arabs, whilst his nephew pursues the insecurity of French opinions. Those are his words um, in, uh, in the uh, Cathedral School of Laon. 
Already we can see in the contrast between studia, studies, which implies critical investigation, and the sententia, the opinions, which can be based on no sound, may be based on no sound knowledge. Throughout the work, Adelard contrasts reliance on reason to reliance on authority, i.e. on the opinions of others. Most famously is the passage comparing the words of authority to the painted skin of the prostitute. I'm sorry to bring in the prostitute again, but this is quite a common uh, metaphor. And this entices men only by its surface beauty. Adelard claims to have learnt from his Arab masters with reason as guide, ratione duque, whereas his nephew is in the thrall of the picture of painting of authority. True to his word, Adelard translated from Arabic the, fun uh, the fundamental text on ge geometry and Euclid's elements, as we've just heard, <coughs> and provided two versions of this one text, in fact. One emphasizing the demonstrative nature of the text and the other the axiomatic methodology which Euclid follows. So Arabic truth in the eyes of medieval and Renaissance scholars evokes not only the Arabic language itself, going back to the original text, but also the truth derived from reason and revelation which can be found in works written in the Arabic language. The very fact that so many texts were translated from Arabic into Latin in mathematics, the sphere of demonstrative arguments, natural science and metaphysics, the sphere of rational arguments, and medicine, the sphere of experimental science, is evidence that Western Europeans thought that Arabic texts were valuable and their authors were reliable. They spoke the truth. This attitude can be summed up quite succinctly in a comment by Tommaso Junta in his introduction to all the works of Aristotle together with all the commentaries of Averroes, published in 11 volumes in Venice in 1550-1552, a truly uh, monumental, magnificent monument to Arabic scholarship in Latin. He writes, when Aristotle, whereas Aristotle dealt with principles, methods, and general things in such a way that he left many things to be inspected and investigated more carefully by others, the Greeks made little or rather no effort to do this. But the Arabs, not content with mere translations, thought that the whole subject matter i.e. the things themselves that had to be dealt with, should be investigated by them most carefully and fully. In this, Averroes, or Ibn Rushd, especially can be praised. His most solid teaching is not so much drawn from or s as squeezed out of the water springs of the Greeks. He shone out, not so much that he alone rightly has claimed the name of commentator for himself. And now it should be clear amongst everybody who has practiced philosophy in recent centuries that those parts of philosophy that had been omitted by Aristotle have been investigated more carefully by no other person and no one has established them on more solid foundations than Averroes. So, so much for the importance of the Arabic truth um, of which we will be hearing more, I'm sure, um, during the rest of today. Thank you very much. Thank you.